at the very bottom of the study, it says the only thing, it goes, short people live longer. Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Give a big hand clap to those that are watching us on podcast, vidcast. I was looking for the camera. I finally found it. And uh, we're glad. If you're ever in the area, you know what? I'm, I make this promise to you. If you join us, we'll make you feel right at home. So a blonde, a redhead, and a brunette are walking through a castle. And they come across uh, this big old mirror. looks enchanted or something. And on the bottom of it, it's engraved, liars beware. Well, the redhead walks up to it and says, I think I'm the most beautiful woman in the world. And poof, she disappears. Redhead walks up to it and says, well, I think that I'm the smartest woman in the world. And poof, she disappears. The blonde walks over to it, checks her hair a little bit, teeth a little bit, smiles in it, and goes, I think, poof, she disappears. Come on, who's ready for the Word today? Anybody out there excited? Open up your Bibles if you got them, or your phones, whatever you have, to John 5, 6. We're the second week of just a fun series called M&Ms. You should have got maybe some M&Ms on your way in. And, uh, you know, I had, I don't, I couldn't tell you how many people this week have, have let me know. They're like, you know what, after that Sunday, I've been eating M&Ms all week long. That's not the goal. That's not how I want to grow the church, Amen. Which is interesting because Holly's been on me to, to, you know, to get healthier, right? Get healthier. And so, uh, like this morning before church, I did crunches. Amen? Come on, somebody. I did my crunches. I don't know if you've tried the Nesty crunches. They're very good. I had like three of them. And then she wants me to eat clean. And so, eat clean, eat clean, eat clean. And so, finally, I'm like, fine. So, every morning, I have a donut in the shower. And so, I'm eating clean. Hey, I got a honk out of that. <laughs> M&M's means move and momentum. That when I begin to move, I begin to gather the momentum that I need to break through. The devil knows this. The devil knows he can't stop you. Can't stop you. The only thing that can stop you is yourself. And so he tries to put something in front of you as soon as you decided to go to college, as soon as you decided to go to school and further your education, as soon as you decided to start that business or ask that person out, as soon as you decided to begin to move to the promises that God has for you, all of a sudden the Red Sea showed up. There was a Jericho that showed up. There was a giant that showed up in your life. But I, nothing can stop me except for me. And as long as I decide to continue to move the momentum and God behind me, I'll break through every single wall that the devil puts in front of me. There's not an obstacle that's big enough, not a giant that won't fall, a Red Sea that won't get parted, as long as I keep moving. My dad has these uh, laws that is one of his great books that he has. The second law of Dr. Tom's thermodynamics is everything that's in motion has life. And that's true. God created everything to be moving. And when it moves, it gathers what it needs to do what it's designed to do. When it stops moving, that's when it begins to lose life. When you stop moving in your marriage, your marriage begin to lose life. When you stop moving and giving your best in your job, it seemed like that began to lose its life. It's like water. When water stops moving, lakes dry up. And we see things in our life begin to dry up, different relationships and maybe financial things that begin to drive up. But what's exciting is as soon as I begin to start moving again, I begin to cut my way through just like any river. I begin to pattern my way through just like any river. I begin to make a difference. How many people know that the Grand Canyon was made impossible by just moving? It was moving water, and you were designed to cut through this life and make and leave your mark, mark on this lifetime. By what? By I got to move. And when I move, I gain that momentum. You know, Abraham was told twice by God to move. The first time he didn't move and nothing happened and changed in his life. The second time he moved to where God told him and he began to abound in God's favor in his life. Gideon was stuck doing nothing, afraid. He said, I'm the bottom, I'm the worst of the worst. And as soon as he began to move, he changed and helped Israel overcome all those that were holding them back. The same thing for you. When you start to move, you begin to change not just you, but everybody around you. And what happens is you gain the momentum that you need to break through. Yesterday, we were at 
for 12 hours, which I, I'd love it. Uh, Peyton's last wrestling uh, tournament forever, right? He took fourth in state. Come on, somebody out there. So proud of him. Fourth in state. And uh, it was exciting. It, it, was just, it was just an epic day, a great day. And uh, his very first match, right? His very first match, and uh, he's up. And uh, all the parents, we're all set together. The Mountain View parents are set together. They're like, oh, Payton's up, Payton's up. And so on there, there's six mats, right? There's two here, two, and then two in the way back. And Payton's on this very first mat just right in front of us. And so we're like, oh, Payton's up, right? And so we're watching it. And, uh, you know, I'm cheering and clapping a little bit and talking like I do. And really, Holly is, like, clapping a little bit. She's not the crazy mom. You know, every stadium has that crazy mom. And if you don't know who it is, it's probably you. There's always that crazy mom. That's cr Holly's not that way. She claps nice, and she's, she, right, she'll give a little woo-hoo here and there. But she's quiet. And Peyton is just, he's just destroying this kid. He's just winning by a lot on this kid, doing over and over. Finally, Peyton wins. We all cheer. Holly, no cheer, right? There's no cheer at all. And so I thought that was weird. And then she's real quiet for almost a half an hour. And so I start a little conversation with her, and she goes, so... What do you think? I go, what do you think about what? She goes, about Peyton's match. I go, well, you know, it's what we expected. We expected that one. She goes, you expected him to lose? I go, what? What do you mean he won? She goes, no, he lost. I'm like, what mat were you watching? She goes, way in the back. I go, well, he won way up in the front. <laughs> For a half an hour, emotionally, she had stopped moving because of what she thought was what she was seeing. I wonder how many times as Christians we're seeing defeat when there is victory all around us. Israel gets away from Egypt and all they can see is the Red Sea. They can't celebrate the victory of no longer being a slave. David shows up. He had to see the victory past the giant. When the giant falls, God's going to catapult me into something bigger in life. we got to learn to see the victory. Come on, somebody in this house, a honk out there. Learn to see the victory. So you keep moving. I'm going to share two very key points with you today. Uh, two things that I believe that are going to help us get moving. And those of us that are stuck, right? Oftentimes we find ourselves stuck in a rut. How to get the mental inside of us that you need to get your life moving towards God's best in your life. And so we see it here in um, John 5, 6. And uh, Jesus talking here. When Jesus saw, so he comes up on this guy who's been, been crippled for almost his entire life. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long, long time, he asked him, do you want to be healed? Do you want it? In your head, don't you? I read that and I go, well, that's a dumb question. Does it doesn't sound dumb. Do you want to walk? Do you want to stop lying down there? But... It's interesting how many times we stop moving and there's a subconscious part that we don't know about that really tries to hold us where we're at. Because most psychologists, including my boy Dr. Phil, will say this, there's something called the payoff. And people will stay in their junk and they'll complain and they'll hate it, not realizing that there's a subconscious payoff that keeps them from trying to move out of their junk. It keeps them locked into their junk. So, for instance, this guy here, what's his payoff? Well, his payoff is every day people feel bad for him. Every day people are like, hey, poor guy. Every day people give him money. Every day, like he gets people just walking up and encouraging him. If he decides to get healed... Things get harder immediately, but they get way better up ahead, right? Well, how do they get harder? Because now he's got to get a job, right? That's harder than just sitting on the street. Now he's going to have to encourage himself. Now people aren't going to walk up. People are going to feel bad for you. People aren't going to treat you the way they used to treat you when you were crippled. There is a lot of stuff. Now you're going to take responsibility for your life. You're going to have to do and you're going to have to go forth. And it's an upfront thing that you're going to have to do. But the payoff up ahead, see, the devil's all about immediate gratification. So people will stay in their junk. Do you want to stop being depressed? Well, of course I do, Pastor. But remember, there's a subconscious payoff. 
Once again, you can complain about your problems. You can talk about everything that's bad in your life, right? And let's be honest. I don't know if you'll all be honest with me today. Sometimes, doesn't it feel good to feel bad? You ever had that where you, it just feels good to feel bad? Last year at State, Peyton lost to a kid that he had beaten earlier uh, in the year convincingly. He lost. It was just a fluke thing. And then Holly's like, you know, a- after a little while, she's like, hey, come on. She's trying to cheer me up. And I go, honey, I want to feel bad for just a little while longer. That's what I want to do. I want to feel bad for a little while. You ever done that? Like it feels good to sit and feel bad and people treat you different and poor you. And what, it's a, right, they, they treat you because guess what? If you choose to stop and moving past being depressed and into God's joy, there's work right now. I've got to capture every thought. I've got to watch everything that I say, right? That, I, I can't slip even one time. It's a lot of work to get happy, but how many people know that up ahead in God's joy, right? The question is, is do you want? Well, I want success. Do you? Do you really want success? Because with success comes a lot of work up front, right? It's easy to be average. It's easy to just get by in your job. It's easy not to study and read books and read three books a week. It's easy not to do that. But the payoff of success is saying, I'm going to give my best tomorrow. I'm going to start this tomorrow. I'm going to learn jobs that are not even mine tomorrow. I'm going to read a couple books on success this week, every week going forward. I'm going to further my education. It's a lot of work up front. But how many people know that the payoff And the question to you today, who wants to move to God's success in their life? Come on. It takes work to do laps around Jericho. It was easy in the wilderness when food was just coming in. They were just getting chalupas delivered every single day. (laughs) But to take Jericho, now comes a responsibility because as soon as we took it, now we got to work the land. Now, we got to work what we own, right? Now, as I climb up, there's more responsibility in life, right? To have a great marriage, it's easy. You know what? It's it's easy to have a cruddy marriage. It's not better, but it's easy, right? You don't have to love each other. You don't have to forgive. You can be angry. You can say whatever you want, whatever you want to. You can do whatever you want. It's easy. To have a great marriage takes work, right? I got to lay down my life for you. There's times I want to say something, and I got to bite that little tongue of mine. Come on, somebody. I want to... Come on, I gotta forgive. I gotta let it go. I gotta put your needs ahead of my needs. I gotta do what you wanna do, right? But the payoff up ahead of success, of no longer being crippled in your marriage, is way better than the payoff of staying in the junk of life. We, uh, me and my dad were uh, skiing as I was snowboarding, he was skiing. And uh, so we, we get done about half of the day. It's time for lunch, and we go down to the lodge. And as we're going to the lodge, there's, you know, there's snow drifts all over the place, and they're usually roped off. So there's a little roped-off area, and we looked over, and there was a, a lady just laying in the, de- you know, the deep snow. She was down about this far. She just looked like she was going to do a snow angel, but she wasn't. She was just laying in the snow. And my dad goes, hey, do you need some help? And she goes, no, I'm fine. I said, all right. So we go in, and uh, it's one of the best parts of, of snowboarding and skiing is when you take the boots off, it feels so good, and the warmth hits you, and then you go get that Indian fry bread with the chili on it, and right, you get the French fries, and you just eat up, and you get by the fire, and you warm up, and then, all right, let's go back out. You put your boots back on, right? You feel good, and so we're going back outside, and we look over, and she's still laying right there. My dad goes, are you sure you're fine? She goes, no, I'm not fine. Can you help me? It's been like an hour. So we get her out. My dad's like, well, why didn't you ask us? She goes, well, I've been falling so much all day long. And when I fell that last time in the soft snow, I thought, let's just lay here. (laughs) And she's like, and then I couldn't get out. And how many times... Right? Do we fall down and we decide, I'm just going to lay here. Things didn't work out in that relationship. I'm just going to lay here in my little pity party. Things didn't work out and that business failed and we're just going to lay here. Instead of being people that I just keep getting up and I keep getting up. And devil, you think you knock me down, but I will arise. And I will arise. And I will arise. I'll start another business. I, I had 14 failed businesses until I had a successful one. Why was it that I get to the successful one? I had to burn through the 14 bad ones. Amen? And that's the life we live, that I will not stop moving. We have to be a church that when I get knocked down in something, that I continue to move. I'm not going to get comfortable because it gets cold in there when I stop moving. 
I got to begin and continue to move. And some maybe that are watching, maybe you know somebody, you stop moving in different areas of your life. And now you notice that marriage isn't as good as it used to be, right? Life is not as good, the job, the life. And all you have to do is make a decision today. Do I want to move? Yes. Anybody out there want to start moving? Come on, somebody out there. I want to move. I always want to move. I'll move the rest of my life. Second thing that I want, number one, is make a decision that you're going to move. Make a decision. Say, I am going to move starting today. Number two is the limiting factor in our, in our mind that has been put on us by society, oftentimes by ourselves. It could be parents. It could be uh, teachers growing up. That the world tries very hard to stop you from moving. Right? The devil does. The devil knows that if this body right here all started moving, we take over Mesa, we take over Arizona, we take over the nation. Come on, in this right here, you start moving, there's some politicians that would change Washington in here, some pastors that start a revival. There's some people in this house, outside, in the cars out there that make such a big difference that the devil knows it if we stop started moving. And so the society and the news and everything wants to give us the reasons why we shouldn't move. Excuses is what they are. There are limitations that are on us that say, well, you know, I'm not smart enough, Pastor. You know, I, I don't know if, 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 if I could do that. I don't know because of my educational background, because of my past, because of my, my DNA, because of where I came from, because of my pedigree. I couldn't do this, right? Because they have all of these things now. There, there's new, you find on the news, they have all the reasons why certain people can be more successful. And it seems like we always fall into the bad ones one way or another. They have all the different stats and things. It's the color of your skin. That matters so much and how far you can go. And we begin to buy in and to believe that it is my culture, it's my skin, it's where I came from. It's my pedigree. And we forget that it is my God that dictates how far I go. It ain't anything else. They want you to believe that you are limited and you cannot move because of that junk. Just like Gideon, you know, you think, you think Gideon had the same thing. Gideon said this to the angel. He said, my clan is the lowest of the clans and I'm the lowest of that clan. He said, that's why I can't do the things that God has. And God's like, it ain't about you. It's about me working through you. It's about the power that I am going to put through you in your life. It ain't about anything any out here. It's none of your limits that you've allowed your mind to believe in. Right? It ain't, what, it ain't what I can't do. It's what I can do through Christ Jesus. My Bible says I can do all things. I was with, um, I got a buddy. He's six foot ten. Right. And uh, and so I was with him and another buddy. We we're driving. We we're going to lunch. And of course, the short guy's in the back seat. So I'm in the back. Everybody gets to be up front. And uh, I don't know how this conversation. So it wasn't meant to be a mean conversation at all. It's just a conversation that came up. And uh, my tall friend happened to find this super cool study and he shared it with us. He's like, there's this study. And then I looked it up on my phone as he was talking. Uh, he says that tall people are much more successful than short people. Well, that's good news for me as I'm sitting in the back seat in the little kid's seat. And so, and so then and I'm looking at it as we're talking about it. And it's like, boom, every single thing. Tall people make more money. Tall people climb the ladder of success. They go up higher in the corporations. Tall people are better leaders. They get hotter women. Right? Everything. They, they enjoy Taco Bell more probably. Everything that you can imagine. No, look, you can look it up. It's on there. They've done this extensive study. And so as I'm sitting there, everything we talked about was just a jab in me. A jab. A jab. <laughs> And the emotions were just building up, building up, building up in me. I was just getting so angry and frustrated and mad at the whole thing. And why in the world, God, really, you couldn't just give me a few extra inches, like three, four inches? That's, a, that's beyond what God can do, right? I'm just getting angry back there about all my limits. And what in the world's going on? Isn't that how your mind begins to work? Or what? Well, I don't even know if I'll even probably, who knows? If Holly's going to be home when I get there. I don't know. I don't know what's going on now. My whole life seems to be falling apart in the last 30 seconds. And then I got to the bottom, though. At the very bottom of the study, it says the only thing, it goes, short people live longer. No, no. Now, this doesn't make it right. What I did right here didn't make it right. But I want you to know my emotion that it came through. I let out a scream, and I went, you died before me. 
I said, and at your funeral, I'll talk about all the super cool things that you did, because I'll still be here and you'll be gone. <laughs> See, I, did, I am so glad that no one told me in junior high and high school and college that, hey, Scott, yeah, it's stacked against you. You're not going to go far. You won't, you know, right? Because tall people have everything going for them, and you don't have much going for you. So you're going to want to just kind of just lay back and just get by. See, no one told me, right, that, that I could graduate from ASU from the top of my class. Nobody told me that I could, could write eight books. Nobody told me I couldn't write eight books. Nobody told me that I couldn't start a multi-million dollar corporate. Nobody told me that I could run one of the largest churches in the Southwest. Nobody told me, right, nobody told me that I couldn't do these things. Because it wasn't what I can and cannot do. It's what God can do through me. And there's not a limit that the devil and any stupid Harvard study could put out there that could hold me back. And I wonder how many things hold us back out here. How many things that people told us, that we heard it on the news, that told us what we can do and can't do and what we can have and what we cannot have here in... Uh, I'm going to read the Second Peter 1.3. This is for somebody out there. It says, His divine power, whose power? God's power, has given us everything. How many things? Has given us everything we need for a great life through the knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and His own power. Power is not in what I don't have. Power is in what I do have that I put in God's hands. You don't need much to go far in life if you put it in God's hands. You don't need but just a little bit of talent. You don't have to be the most talented person is what I found out about that, right? The least, how many people know that God loves to take the people on the bottom and take them to the top because he gets the most glory. He doesn't take the smartest, right? He don't take the tallest. He takes who is willing to give them what they got. Jesus asked when they said, hey, we got 5,000 people here. Kind of like today, maybe we'll do it today. We got 5,000 people, no food. They didn't have food trucks back then. And what was the question Jesus asked? Did he go, well, I guess God didn't want anybody to eat. I don't know what we're going to do. What was his question? He said, what do we got? Why did he say that? Because he knows for every circumstance, he has already positioned everything that we need for the miracle that we need in our lives. Somebody said, well, we just got, right? And see, the world will go, well, we just got a little bit of fish, right? I just got a little bit of intelligence. I just got a little bit of talent. God's got, good, that's all that I need to make the miracle happen in your life. Elijah was the same way. The woman was like, I have nothing. I'm going to die. And Elijah asked her, and she goes, what do you got? She goes, well, I just got a little bit of oil, and then we're just going to go die. He says, bring me what you got. Moses was whining and complaining when God was trying to call him to save Israel. Moses was like, I can't do it. I'm not built for it. This is not, I'm not good at anything. Right? They just kept arguing back and forth. You ever do that with God? God, I can't do that. You gave me this idea. I can't start that. Come on. You don't know me, God. Come on. You know my failures. There's no way. And finally, God says, what do you got, Moses? Moses goes, the only thing I got is this staff. God says, good. That'll be the same staff that I used to gobble up the Pharaoh's snakes. That'll be the staff that I used to part the Red Sea. That'll be the staff that I use to have water that, that thir brings the thirst to my people. What do you got? Put it in God's hands. Don't ever let anyone or anything or yourself tell you that you don't have what you need for success. If God gave you an idea, I say this is the year to move on that idea. Don't wait any longer. Don't give yourself another excuse to stop moving. Say, I am moving. Come on, I'm moving to God's best, whatever that might be. I, want, I, I am. I'm going to share this last one. Give me this last little bit. I don't have a timer, so I don't know. I think I have time, though. Um, I wanted to go to Judges 331. This is my favorite. So sandwiched in this whole thing, you, you got to go look at it. It's really cool. They have all of these great judges and what they did in the Bible. Then here in Judges 3, uh, 331, it says, After Ehud came Shamgar. Somebody say Shamgar. Shamgar, son of Anath, I don't think most of us have ever heard of him, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, he too saved Israel. I'm like, that's cool. My gosh, Shamgar, 600, struck down 600, saved Israel. 
And I go, and I wanted to read some more. You know, he's never ever in the Bible again. He got two verses. He did something epic and amazing. He killed 600 with, a, with, with an ox guard. You know what that is? It's like a big stick. That's all that it is. 600, right? You, get, you got Samson. He gets chapter after chapter. You got all these people. But Shamgar gets two ver- He gets one verse in the Bible. It's like, to me, it was like reading a comic book. Like you like Spider-Man for 20 pages. You're like, woo! And then they come to like Pastor Man. Woo, Pastor Man. And he just goes, and he slayed 600 henchmen. And then there was nothing. And then they went right on to somebody else. And you're like, well, I want to see Pastor Man. What happened to him? I want to hear his story. Shamgar with a, a stick put in God's hands was able to save Israel. Well, Pastor, I ain't got much. Yeah, the little you got in God's hands could save Mesa, could save Arizona, could make a difference in this world. Come on, somebody out there. People with far less than you have done far greater things than I have simply because they are a willing vessel to get moving toward what God has. Well, I only have a dream. That's all Joseph had. God put him second in charge of all of Israel. Well, I guess I'm just, you know, I'm loyal. I'm devoted. That's what Ruth had. And to put it right in the path of being in the genealogy of Jesus Christ and being the great-great-grandmother of David. Well, I'm just dedicated to God and His Word. Okay, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego changed a nation by just simply sticking to the principles of God's word in their life. Daniel only had a prayer. Changed an entire nation with a prayer. What do you got? I can guarantee you this. If you put that in God's hands, he'll use you to make a difference. It'll be a difference in your job. It'll be a difference in your family. It'll be a difference around you. Whatever it is, if you take the little bit that God has given you and put it in his hands and start moving with it, there isn't a giant, there isn't a wall, there isn't a, anything that can possibly keep you from getting to God's best in your life. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know where you're going to end up one day when you die, I want to give you that opportunity to get saved. It's simple. It's easy. You don't have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead. I get it. You're going to make some more mistakes. We all do. But it doesn't take away your salvation. When I believe, I'm saved. Say this prayer with me. Believe it in your heart and you're saved. Dearly Father, I ask you right now, come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, Amen. You're saved. Make sure you get yourself in a church. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.